Welcome to Destination Michigan. We celebrate the people and places that make Michigan a great place to live. Sit back and enjoy tonight's edition of Destination Michigan. Support for Destination Michigan is provided by the CMU Bookstore. T-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, maroon and gold memories, and an official outfitter of Adidas apparel at the Central Michigan University owned and operated CMU Bookstore. Online shopping seven days a week at cmubookstore.com. The CMU Bookstore, online at cmubookstore.com, on campus in the University Center, and game day locations at Kelly Short Stadium and the CMU Events Center. And by Country Smokehouse in Elmont, offering a selection of gourmet meats, including homemade sausage and jerky. Also available, custom catering and weekend outdoor barbecues. Information at countrysmokehouse.com. Hello and welcome to Destination Michigan. Tonight we celebrate the wit, the wisdom, and the down-home charm of our fellow producer and good friend Bob Garner with a show that we like to call, and so we will, The Best of Bob. Bob has spent the last three years taking us to his favorite little towns to meet his favorite people. So we decided we would put together our favorite stories from one of our favorite people. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the small town charm and the big time smile of Bob Garner as we kick off tonight's edition of Destination Michigan, The Best of Bob. Do you remember the good old days when every small town in northern Michigan had an old fashioned hardware store? One with wooden floors and bins of nails and the owner who could tell you how to fix just about anything? Well, Bob Garner remembers and the good old days are still alive in the tiny town of Tustin. Nestled in a small little valley at the headwaters of the Great Pine River in northern Osceola County is a little gem of a town named Tustin. Recruited workers from Sweden built this community well before the turn of not the last century, but the one before that. That Swedish influence can be seen in a number of ways with churches and centennial markers and even private displays of Nordic pride. Originally called New Blekinge, if I've got that right, it has been for a very long time, named after the minister who recruited the Swedes that settled it, Reverend J.P. Tustin. It has what any solid little town has. It has a bank, a small grocery store with jerky being its claim to fame, a diner and a handful of other businesses. But the anchor of this little village is a business that one family has owned since World War II, actually a little before. A place that reminds you of the old TV show Cheers because everyone knows your name. With its creaky wooden floors, Hoagland Hardware remains a solid staple in this community. Now, how does a little hardware continue to stay in business in these days of the big box stores? In the years you've had this, what, 75 you bought this place, bought it right? January 1st, 1975, yeah. How does a hardware store like this one, how do you survive in, in the age of the big box stores? Service, I guess, is what what we got to count on. Doing chainsaws and what are you doing? Chainsaws, sharpen the the chains. Big business That's, there. Oh yeah, yeah. We have chains every day. We have to sharpen. Okay, you've got yeah. chains and and windows. Uh, the last time windows. I needed a screen, screens. I had yeah. I had to come here because no one else fixes. Nobody them. else. The box stores don't do anything like that. So that's what we do now. Now, Uncle Evan bought this place in 1941. 41. From Mrs. Toland. Yeah. Okay, and it was in business quite a while before that. How has th how have things changed since you got into the business uh, about 35 years ago? We'd done uh, chainsaws and, and thread and pipe and stuff like that back then too, but uh, it's just got bigger and bigger now because nobody there's no hardware left. We're what, the only one left around. What's gone? To, what's happened to all the hardware stores? Went broke, I guess. Ace Hardware and Cadillac, Johnson Hardware, they all 
they all went out of business and we just hung in there, I guess. Third generation now. Lauren Hoagland, you're the owner of the hardware store now. Third in a list of Hoaglands that have owned it. What piqued your interest in, in, in owning a hardware store like this? I worked at a shop in Cadillac for 10 years and dad had decided he was ready to retire so it was either buy it or let him sell it to somebody else and we decided that this would be a good opportunity for us. It's got to be fun for you like I'm sure it was for your dad just to be helpful. Yeah, um, that's a big part of our business. Obviously we're not going to survive if we can't help people. Um, pretty much somebody come, they can come in here with an electrical building plumbing problem, somebody who doesn't know how to fix that stuff and, and you know, generally they're going to get help. Your dad has a motto around here. If we don't have it, you don't need it. <laughs> One more time. If we don't have it, you don't need it. <laughs> and it's pretty much the truth because there's not very much you don't have. Well, what we find is if we don't have it, you don't need it. <laughs> it's not a necessity. <laughs> Our final destination tonight might remind you a bit of the TV town of Mayberry. But instead of Barney Fife, we've got Bob Garner. Instead of Floyd the Barber, we have Mike and Dave. And instead of Mayberry, we take you to Indian River, where a shave and a haircut might not be two bits anymore, but it comes with a side of politics and gossip and a whole lot of fun. Indian River is a town with contradictions. Now in the summertime, this place is busy as all get out with the tourists. Tourism, that's the industry that feeds this town. Tourists that stop to see the breathtaking sight of the cross in the woods, something I remember vividly as a young boy of eight. Tourists that stay at the state park, tourists that enjoy Burt and Mullet Lakes and shopping the many fine stores. Folks from Southern Michigan and out of staters, many from Ohio come here to summer homes good folks who use summer as a verb. Main Street, the old US 27 is busy, but not so in winter. The little town known locally as IR turns into a snowy Mayberry with full-time solid citizens that are not scared off by a little winter weather. Indian River is not really even a town legally, just a post office. And the town center, especially in the winter, is the barber shop. Mike and Dave's Barbershop is a place to discuss the weather, local news, local politics, and even share a little gossip or play a practical joke. Mike, this place is always busy. There's people here, the coffee pot's on. Not everybody's getting a haircut, though. What's going on here? There's a lot of uh, talk about what's going on in town, about our sewer system maybe going in. Um, a lot of different things. Tell me about Barbin. Is it is it changed a lot? You've been here since 1974. Yeah. Is yeah. it changed? No, it hasn't changed much, except for me. I just got old. Yeah. So <laughs> I was 24 when I come here, and I'm going to be at a 60 here right shortly. <laughs> <laughs> well, what a good place to be. Yeah, it was a great place to, you know, raise a family. Any better place on earth than Indian River? No. No, I haven't found one yet. How long's Dave been here? Since '84. So he's, he's, he's getting right along there too. Yeah, I don't know if he's got 30 and out planned or not. But <laughs> How'd you get started in the barbering business, Dave? I actually cut hair in the service in the Navy. I was, uh, and then after I got out of the Navy, I went to school and learned how to really cut hair. So, and I enjoy it. I enjoy talking to people. It's a great job. You know, everybody's different and uh, every haircut's a new challenge. It's it's fun. The atmosphere around here makes this a fun place to go to. I, I say that's as important as the haircut. Oh yeah, yeah. You gotta learn how to dish it out, but you gotta learn how to take it too. <laughs> now, there are people like Ridley was suspiciously around here today. Mike, you obviously don't need a haircut once not, or twice a week. Not too often. Why do you stop in? I just, I, 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 do, I enjoy the, the atmosphere. I enjoy the, uh, the, the, the BS. We have a lot of fun talking, just catching up on everything. And, and to be quite honest with you, Mike and Dave have a lot of input as to what goes on in the, in the township. I'm always curious to hear their, their point of view. I think it was just a good way for him to get the feel of the community, what's going on. He, he asked a lot of questions like, well, what are people saying about this? Or what are people saying about that? And that's, for a township supervisor, that's, you know, I feel like he's doing his job. He wants to know what's going on in the area. Local township supervisor Mike Ridley says, Mike and Dave are 
unofficially known as the mayors of Indian River. Nothing happens here in Indian River without going through this place first, does it? Everything comes right through here. I mean, politics, sports, religion, rumors, it all starts right here. Rumors? Rumors. Good rumors? I love them. I got this morning told that, uh, started the one that Mike uh, was gonna have to have a makeup man before he went on camera. And of course, he started sweating and then really needed a makeup man. <laughs> <laughs> well, our final stop tonight is all about a perfect partnership. When you think of two things that go together, you might think of peanut butter and jelly, or Batman and Robin, or Bert and Ernie. But for our Bob Garner, the perfect partnership has got to be cops and donuts. To Claire we go, where Bob is under arrest, but for some reason he refuses to be bailed out as he spends some time with cops and donuts. You know, one of my favorite towns in this great old state of Michigan is Claire, and one of my favorite places to go of course, the donut shop. The freeways and exits of 127 and US 10 make it much easier to avoid going through downtown Clare. But unless you're on your way to a fire or in a heck of a big hurry, don't do it. Downtown Clare has lots to offer. The Doherty Hotel, the White House Restaurant, Jay Sporting Goods to the North, to name just a few highlights of the city that's named after a county in Ireland. But the highlight of this trip to Clare is to share with you one of my frequent destinations and favorite destinations, the Cops and Donuts Bakery right smack in the middle of downtown Clare. Greg Reinerson is a Clare City police officer known as Rhino around the town that tells us a story about how the cops bought the donut shop. Greg, Cops and Donuts, what a, a great concept, but how did this really come about? Because the truth is, you cops really own this donut shop. True story, yep, we're all real police officers. We still work full time. Uh, back in May of uh, 2009, we got word that the bakery was gonna close. It was coming up on 113 years. You know, I've been stopping at this bakery for 40 years or so. Thank you. Yeah. Continue to come. <laughs> I will. But uh, anyways, we got word it was gonna close. Coming up on 113 years old. It was one of our foundation uh, businesses here in Clare. And the nine of us uh, got together and we thought we can't let it close, you know. When you have a business that's been open that many years, bad things start happening and we wanted to keep it open. So the nine of us, uh, we did an actual uh, business plan on a pizza box that day and we locked down an agreement with the owners and on July 1st, it became Cops and Donuts. She closed the day before, we opened the next day. There are nine, nine officers, uh, sworn uh, peace officers in the Clare Department, correct? Right, it's the entire full time. The chief, administrative assistant, two sergeants, and five officers. We all equally own it. You found a bunch of interesting things in these buildings too when, when, when you bought it. One, the Purple Gang used to have a hideout here, right? That was a story. That's the pharmacy next door here. They uh, frequented- the, Where we're at right now. The, yeah, right. We're in the old uh, pharmacy. It was built in 1908. Uh, Merle Houghton had it. And he had a connection with the Pearl, uh, Purple Gang. He was the pharmacist. <laughs> and uh, we had had stories that there was a secret passage in this building. And I thought it was hogwash till we bought it. And it's actually there. We found it. Can we see it? Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. I'll take you down there. I know your line of work is being a, uh, a police officer and you, you take your craft very seriously as a police officer, but are you having fun with the donuts here? I'm having a lot of fun with it. I'm over 20 years on the road now and I'm looking at the retirement. It's a lot more fun uh, playing with donuts than writing tickets. You, you meet people on a different level. That's why here we go by our nicknames. Um, for 20 some years I've had my last name pinned to my chest, Ray Nearson. And you hear the name Ray Nearson and it just, you get a funny feeling from it. So here we want to be called by our nicknames. Every one of us have our nicknames. I'm Rhino by my nickname. And it's just a lot more fun when they come in. I may have arrested the guy two weeks before, but he comes in here, hey Rhino, I need an apple fritter. And it's just a lot more fun. 
it's kind of fun to hang around with you today and eat donuts and uh, drink a little coffee. Fresh brewed cops coffee. Fresh brewed. <laughs> If your stomach is growling like mine and you need your donut fix, head to the Cops and Donuts website at copsdonuts.com. Our final destination takes us from ice in our freezer to ice on a lake. Our Bob Garner has spent many of his Michigan winters out on the ice in search of the perfect wintertime fishing hole. The search continues for that perfect place, but at least this time he found the perfect fishing partner. Mark Martin is a professional walleye fisherman who teaches his craft at his famous ice fishing school. So let's hit the ice of Lake Mitchell because school is in session as we head to Cadillac to wrap up tonight's edition of Destination Michigan. This is the stuff of front page stories, breaking news, at least locally, and hopefully no breaking ice. But the greatest ice fishing school in Michigan has come to Lakes Cadillac and Mitchell to share the secrets and the tips from professional anglers to help others learn more about the sport. A Sunday seminar on ice fishing filled its venue and left people looking for a place to park and then a place to sit once they got there. Mark Martin of Muskegon heads up this famous ice fishing school and this year decided to make the Cadillac area his teaching destination. Mark, there's schools of fish, there's K-12 schools, you know, uh, <laughs> post-K-12 colleges. What about an ice fishing school? Where in the Sam Hill did you come up with that idea? My friends in the outdoor raider field, uh, we'd take them out uh, outdoor raiding, you know, on these events just like we're having here. And then uh, one time, a few of the outdoor raiders says, don't they take the public? 22 years ago, we uh, uh, said, let's do that. You know, and it's been the longest running, biggest ice fishing school of its kind in North America. And we've, uh, you know, run hundreds and hundreds of uh, students through and hundreds and hundreds of outdoor media people through and just teaching them how to use uh, technology. And you've been doing this for a long time. You and I have been friends for <laughs> nigh on to 30 years now. Oh, yeah. And I've learned a lot from you, too. But most people can pick up a few uh, tips and catch fish pretty quick with ice fishing, especially first-timers. So oh. You like the first-timers better than the guys who think they know what they're doing? I, I like the people that tell me they don't know a thing about anything because then, I, like I say, I can give them all my bad habits and that's really the, the best thing because they don't have any preconceived ideas of they've been shown and the way they've been shown is a lot of times the wrong way they've been shown, you know, or, or not necessarily the wrong way, but I should say not the efficient way to catch fish. And that's, that's a big deal right there, not to be able to uh, um, have have the opportunity to teach people that think they know more than you and all you're doing is showing them spots you know sometimes people come with you whether I was guiding for a living or they come to a school and they know everything and they're gonna show me how to fish yeah. which is fine maybe I can learn some I, I like learning from people but I tell you what Bob you know the people that come with an open mind and open eyes and open ears and say geez I'm gonna try it that way I've never done it that way before they walk away from our schools with such a positive attitude and they can take on the world or any body of water that's frozen and catch fish. With a little confidence. With confidence. Yeah, yeah. with confidence because yeah. otherwise you come out here and there's a lot more to the sport than just drilling holes and buying bait, isn't there? I mean, I never used to have a GPS, so it was a little tougher. I never used to have cameras. I never used to have fish finders. I never used to have snowmobiles. I never used to have shacks. I'd walk out here with a five-gallon bucket and, and a fishing pole and a handful of wax worms, and uh, hopefully I, I put myself in the right area. Now you have all the technology in the world. You can pretty much put yourself where it should be and if there's no fish there just keep moving and by all means come to one of our schools. You're just putting a minnow on a, on a little treble hook or, yeah. or, or you can use a single hook too. No, well you can use a single hook but a, a treble hook is uh, is the best. And yeah. then you put the depth finder on. Yep and then you find the bottom and I've been setting it up a foot and a half because I'm hoping for walleyes but the other predators are down below swimming around right now and we're catching bass, we're catching northerns, but who knows what's on these out here. We could be lucky and get a, the, the trifecta here pretty soon. This is one of the 
few places uh, around that you can enjoy fishing in action like this on the ice right here. From northern pike to walleye to bass to pumpkin seeds to bluegills to perch. Yeah. They're here, right Bob? All right here, Lake Mitchell, Lake Lake Cadillac where you're doing the school. Hey, I wonder if we should go over and check a tip up. This well, is Yeah, cool. it's probably bothering well, everybody. Let's go, let's go. <laughs> Come on, be a nice walleye or something this time. It's a nice fish. Okay, now we don't have too far to go, so just keep watching for the fish and keep them off the edge of the ice if you can. Ooh, yeah, another bass. There you go, bring them up. My passion is really teaching people, and to me, that's fun. You know, I, I know they're learning something. I'm giving back what I have been taught for the last 50 years. And that's what it's all about, is giving back the sport that you learned to somebody that doesn't know and watch. I live their excitement. It takes me back to when I was six, seven years old again. If Mark can teach Bob a lesson or two, just think what he can do for you. To learn more about Mark's ice fishing school, visit fishingvacationschool.com. Our final stop tonight takes us from the arts in the city to the cows in the country. Our old Bob Garner had a farm, E-I-E-I-O, and on this farm he had some cows, lots of cows. Oh, it's not really Bob's farm, and Bob's not really old, but he really is going to take us to the Misaki County Village of Merritt to introduce us to Beth Vanderwall and her family-owned dairy farm. Let's pull out our bib overalls and get ready to move on out to Merritt as we head down on the farm with Farmer Bob. In many ways, the farming life is a great life. But when it comes to dairy farming and the production of my favorite drink, the work is hard and it is constant. Milking Holsteins up to three times a day, a farmer is virtually married to the herd. And on this farm, located just west of Merritt and east of Lake City, the farmer is a lady, in fact, a young lady. Beth Vanderwall runs the place and thinks that her place in standing on this multi-generational farm is not earth shattering, but something she is happy and very proud of. I asked Beth what part about running a dairy farm she enjoys the most. I like the animals and I like the diversity. I like working outdoors. Enjoy it. The animals all seem to be, be happy when you're around. What, do you have some sort of <laughs> magic you work with them? or No, but I raise them, we all raise them from birth to, to calvings. So they, they're, they're used to us, they like us. I mean, the milk just doesn't come out itself. Right. There's, there's, there's lots of procedure that you have to follow. First of all, the cleanliness has got to be a major concern. Yep, cleanliness is really important, um, and the technique of getting it clean and getting the udder prep properly is important. We use the Michigan Milk Producers Association prep procedure, and that involves um, the cows coming in, we wipe the sand off of them, any debris that's on them first, and we do it in groups of four. So you'd wipe the sand, spray iodine on them, and um, you massage the iodine in, especially to the teat end, that's where most nerve endings are, so that stimulates for milk letdown. It lets them release oxytocin and um, all very scientific. They've done a lot of research on this. Uh, so you do that for four cows. Uh, strip a little milk out of each quarter also. Um, make sure the milk is healthy looking. Um, then you'd go back through and wipe them with a cloth towel, a dry cloth towel, and um, put the attachment on. And it automatically comes off when their milk flow is reduced. And then, and then it's it's stored in, and you have a, a vessel that it, it all is pumped to? Yep, it goes through a filtering system and then a cooling system also. And um, it goes into a bulk tank and it's stored and cooled and it gets shipped once a day. So we have that MMPA milk collar comes once a day. Seven days a week? Seven days a week, rain or shine, sleet or snow, they're here. This family farm's been in your family for how long? Yeah, uh, my grandpa started it in 46. 1946. Yep. So you're, you're looking at, at a bunch of years, 66 years. What's changed over milking procedures from that time till now? There's a lot of smart people working on how to best get milk out of a cow. And um, I think everything's changed from the sanitizing that we use to um, the time to let their milk down. You know, you used to just start milking a cow and just hook the milker up and and now there's like a scientific procedures to follow 
that show that the best milk let down, which gives you the most production, is waiting instead of just attaching. And really massaging them, getting them to where they want to produce. And and lots of things have changed. Grandpa started it and my dad and his brother took it over and then my brother and I are, are coming up to play. And then my brother has sons that all they want to do is be dairy farmer when, when his four-year-old grows up. That's what he says. So it's fun. I think it'll, I think it'll continue on for a few more generations, I hope. We really have a relationship with our animals. We try hard to, to make them happy and make them comfortable. And I, I'm proud of what we do out here. We raise good animals. It wouldn't be a total Best of Bob edition without the Best of Bob bloopers. We leave you tonight with the bits and pieces that didn't quite make it into Bob's stories, and you'll see why. Thanks, Bob, and thank you for joining us tonight on this Best of Bob Garner edition of Destination Michigan. Milking Holsteins up to three times a day is ver... Oh. Lears, oh, let me just read that straight. I decided to go after it. Okay. I'll, I'll just start it all again. A great place to learn more about outdoor activity. Yeah, if you could. I heard some sawing or something. <laughs> that you could be gruntled too. I've never service. heard that expression, yeah. but I suppose. But it is, it's, it's, a, it's a real word, gruntled. <laughs> that better, you big dink. Any for, anything. For, Hi, I'm Bob Garner, and today, oh no. This week on Destination Michigan, we're going to take you to... You know, there's nothing like a really good toy... Uh, you know, usually my type of toy... Or, let's start. Here on Michigan... Or, here on <laughs> Michigan Out of Doors tonight, we're...